May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Uh, my name is John O'Callaghan, and I uh, teach here in the philosophy department. Long-standing relationship with the Center for Ethics and Culture, the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture, and I'd like you to like to welcome you to this morning's session. I'm one of the few people, or I see another few people who might be old enough to remember when this list of Vatican films came out. I was very excited by it, so I'm happy to be chairing this session 30 years on and wonder if any of them are going to talk about the tree of the wooden clogs, um, which is on that I'm film. Not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, our first speaker is, uh, um, sorry, uh, Thomas Miris of, uh, it says parentheses, Catholic culture. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Thomas is the president and editor of the long running website, catholicculture.org. In addition to writing about Catholic art since 2013, he is the host of the Catholic Culture Podcast and co-host of Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, which devoted an episode to every film on the Vatican film list. His writing has also appeared on the blogs of Dappled Things and The New Criterion. He has a degree in jazz piano and worked as a professional musician from 2009 <coughs> to 2022 and the title of his talk is The Vatican Film List, Introduction and Reflections, and the um, format will be as it has been for other sessions. All three will speak first, and then there will be for 20 minutes at each, and then 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So, Tom. Great. All right, should I stand up or? Whichever you prefer. All right, uh, so I'll just do it here. Should I move this or just leave it where it is? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Great. Can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. My, my talk is sort of going to um, set up this whole, this whole panel. Um, and thanks to, uh, to everybody who, who came here this morning. There's a lot of other good things you could have been seeing, so I appreciate it. Um, in 1995, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of cinema, the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Social Communications compiled a list with the modest title, Some Important Films, which they sent out in a packet to Episcopal conferences around the world. This Vatican film list, as it's often called, is a fascinating document, but very few Catholics have ever heard of it. As far as I know, the first English language critic to write extensively about the list was Stephen Gray Donis, who long before any of us here, reviewed every film on the list on his website. Uh, in the past few years, though, there's been a notable revival of interest in the list. In May of 2020, James Majewski and I, uh, he couldn't be here because his wife's due to give birth any minute now, um, launched Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, which for its first three years focused on the Vatican film list, which we completed last year with uh, frequent assistance from filmmaker and critic Nathan Douglas. Also last year, Word on Fire published their own book on the Vatican film list, co-authored by Andrew Pettiprin. And also back in the spring of 2020, uh, shout out to COVID, a group of Dominican friars started their own podcast, Friars and Films, on which they too have been slowly working their way through, among other things, the Vatican film list. Uh, so with this unique document receiving all this renewed attention, it seemed appropriate to call together a panel of some of the people who have been working on this especially because I think this engagement represents a moment of increased openness among Catholics to exploring the art of cinema on a deeper level. Now, for, some of the, for those of you uh, unfamiliar with the list, I'll give a brief overview to start out with. As the title, Some Important Films, indicates, this is not the Vatican's list of the best films ever made. Uh, a note appended to the list described it as, quote, the result of subjective choice, indicative rather than exhaustive, with the purpose of providing, quote, an aid to reflection on what both cinematographic and aesthetic cinema has achieved, in the words of Pope John Paul II, as a communicator of culture and of values, unquote. This is not a magisterial document. It's a list of movies made by more or less a bunch of Italian priests, critics, and professors. Thus, the significance of having come from the Vatican is more cultural than it is authoritative. Catholics are free to criticize the list, on artistic and even on moral grounds. Uh, that said, it's a pretty impressive selection. The list consists of 45 entries broken up into three categories, religion, values, and art. Uh, 
And so there's a recognition that alongside works dealing directly with religion, there's a place for works that more uh, generally express moral or spiritual values, as well as films that are worthy of attention simply for their artistic merit, even, in, even if in some cases their values don't align with the Catholic faith. Uh, about two-thirds of the selections are from continental Europe, alongside a number of Hollywood movies, as well as cinema from the UK and Japan. The majority of the films are widely considered classics of world cinema, but with just enough eccentric picks to keep even a seasoned cinephile interested, plus a couple of inclusions that, to be honest, seem like more of a product of recency bias. Um, to give just a sample, in the religion category, you have films like Andrei Rublyov, Babette's Feast, A Man for All Seasons, and The Passion of Joan of Arc. Under values, there are The Seventh Seal, Schindler's List, Bicycle Thieves, and The Tree of Wooden Clogs. And the art section includes films like 2001, A Space Odyssey, Metropolis, Eight and a Half, and Grand Illusion. So on Criteria, the Catholic film podcast available wherever fine podcasts are downloaded, we de dedicated a full episode, usually an hour or longer, to each movie, making our coverage of the Vatican film list the most extensive that's been done. In this talk, I'll reflect on some of the things we learned and issues that came up as we went through the list. <clears throat> One of the first things to say about the list is that if you commit to working your way through it, you'll come away a very different viewer than you were before, especially if you're used to viewing movies pretty much as entertainment or if you're not familiar with much cinema made outside the United States. Although Hollywood has produced many great films over the decades, there's a whole world of very different formal, aesthetic, narrative, and even economic approaches to cinema, which have resulted in kinds of stories and visions that you won't find in the Hollywood movies of just about any era. This is particularly relevant to films with spiritual and religious subjects. This list will expand your idea of what a movie can look like. You'll see films in which a certain sheen of high production value is considered less important, or in which non-professional actors are used to powerful effect. You'll realize that not every movie has to be focused on advancing a plot. Instead, of a film like The Tree of Wooden Clogs may immerse you in a certain cultural world or a contemplative vision. You'll be exposed to some masterpieces of silent film. You'll see films which deal with faith in a far more direct, solemn, and unembarrassed manner than some movies recently hyped in the Catholic world. On the other hand, you'll also see religious films which are somewhat confounding and don't feed you all the answers. The point is not to elevate one aesthetic approach over another, but if you've only been exposed to one or two approaches, you're missing a great deal of what this art form has to offer. Now, in particular, I want to dwell on the issue of what is often called high production value. Excuse me. There's something of a pathology uh, around high production value in discussion of new religious cinema because it's so often perceived that this, above all, is what's lacking in Christian movies. To, to be clear, there's a real good to be celebrated when a movie or a community of filmmakers achieves a certain level of craft. However, high production value in the truest sense is not a particular look, but it's relative to the goal sought after. Whereas when the average viewer says he wants high production value, he really means something more specific, a commercial or a mainstream aesthetic, which often becomes an illusory metric for cinematic quality. There's a certain gloss or a surface level competence that's easily detected by unschooled viewers. And if a, if, produ if a production can meet the latest commercial standards in lighting, coloring, and sound mixing, the result looks like the kind of movie that normally comes out of Hollywood and is therefore celebrated as Christians finally having made a real movie. What's commonly called high production value then can be less about making something substantially good and more about being accepted as credible or respectable. So it's really about meeting the bar, not so much exceeding it. Uh, if, we couldn't, if we shouldn't confuse high production value with artistic quality, it's also crucial to recognize that low production value doesn't necessarily mean poor craft. Here is where we would benefit from familiarity with an array of masterpieces from outside the Hollywood tradition. A familiarity which is desperately needed if Catholic filmmakers want to make something that lasts and if Catholic viewers want to be fit to receive it. The greatness of Terrence Malick notwithstanding, most of the best religious films have not been American. And that is arguably in part because European films have often been less concerned with 
presenting that glossy view of life that Hollywood inculcates not only through its visuals, but through its conventions of acting and storytelling. America is a Protestant country, and so its movies have often conveyed a Protestant view of what life in this world is supposed to look like. So that begs the question, why should faithful, faithful Catholic filmmakers draw inspiration only from Hollywood and not, say, from cinema from the Catholic cultures of France and Italy? To take two films by Roberto Rossellini, one of which is on the Vatican film list, The Flowers of St. Francis and Journey to Italy do not, and did not even in the 1950s, strike anyone as having high production value. The Flowers of St. Francis is rough and raw and uses non-professional actors. Journey to Italy has little money on the screen. However, they are both placed by secular and religious critics alike among the greatest films ever made. Now, this is not snobbery opposed to the Hollywood style. Sometimes a film calls for a more glossy look, but it must not become an idol to which we sacrifice more substantive goods. What's more important is that a film be truthful in the sense that its style doesn't betray its subject matter. The Flowers of St. Francis is considered the best movie about that saint, in part because its poverty and its simplicity are so well matched to the Franciscan spirit. Catholic filmmakers must not let their vocation be suborned by facile dogmas about high production value. Like St. Francis, they must practice poverty of spirit, by which I mean not necessarily a low budget, but a holy indifference to what could be called the cinematic pride of life, the totems of commercial respectability. Now, when the topic of religious cinema comes up, it's often noted that there have been a number of excellent films about religion made by non-believing directors and that these films are better than most films made by pious Catholics. There are a number of things to say about this. First, this phenomenon of non-Catholic or non-religious directors making very good films on religious subjects shows the absurdity of Catholic artists feeling that they must shy away from a direct focus on the faith in order to achieve artistic excellence. And it likewise calls into question the wisdom of downplaying the faith in order to reach a mass audience. Yet to balance this op observation, the values section of the Vatican film list shows that there is room for films that are imbued with the Catholic spirit, even when not dealing uh, explicitly with faith. Second, and conversely, this observation about the best religious films being made by atheists has become a cliche in our circles, albeit for un understandable reasons. We took this phenomenon for granted at the outset of our podcast project, Yet, as we went through the list and examined each film closely, we started to notice that the unbeliever's perspective is frequently limited in more or less subtle ways, even in some films that are rightly beloved. To take a well-known example, there's the question of whether A Man for All Seasons is really about religion or about a modern individualistic view of freedom of conscience. Or take Alain Cavalier's film Therese, which is remarkable, yet takes a somewhat ambivalent stance towards its subject or what I would call an overall emotional frigidity in Pasolini's film of the Gospel according to Matthew, as though the story were told by an outsider looking in. Or to take a film not on the Vatican film list, uh, the unfortunate omission of the sacramental life and even the best films about saints, uh, such as Terence Malick's A Hidden Life. Now, as grateful as we should be for some wonderful films about religion made by non-Catholics, ideally Catholics would be telling our own stories. We, of course, can't deny the prerogative of Catholic artists to make work which is not explicitly religious in its subject, yet manifests a Catholic vision of reality. But it must be pointed out that if talented Catholic artists avoid religious subjects, then the consequence will be that those subjects will be left either to mediocre Catholic artists or to non-Catholic artists who, however excellent, lack that greater spiritual depth which only comes when you understand the faith from the inside. This is especially the case now that non-believing artists no longer benefit from having been raised in a religious culture, as so many of the great religious filmmakers of the past, like Rossellini, for example, uh, had. On that point, there's a danger in fully accepting this cliche about non-believers making great religious art. Namely, it allows Catholics to let ourselves off the hook spiritually. If it's truly not necessary even to believe in God to make great religious art, then I can tell myself that I don't need to be holy to comment on these matters. It gives the Catholic artist the excuse to see personal conversion as inessential to the pursuit of his vocation. To be clear, the spirit blows where it will, and there are certainly God-given charisms which can operate in people who are deeply sinful. But Catholic artists will fail 
They will not produce works which bear fruit for eternal life. If they are complacent or presumptuous about the level of spiritual insight they can bring to bear on their work without diligently seeking holiness and being formed by the tradition of the church. Finally, a bit about the moral implications of the Vatican film list. It's been observed that the list represents a different approach from that of the church during the golden age of Hollywood when we had the Catholic Legion of Decency rating films and telling Catholics which ones to avoid. By contrast, the 1995 Vatican film list includes one film that was condemned by the Legion of Decency, Fellini's Eight and a Half, and some others that surely would have been condemned or at least rated morally offensive for good reason had the Legion existed at the time of their release. I think it's clear enough that we shouldn't interpret the inclusion of any given film on this list as an endorsement of everything about it. The Vatican, for better or for worse, simply presented this list of films without any comment on their individual content. That said, the publication of this list does indeed manifest a shift in ecclesiastical culture of a piece with the more general world embracing optimism of the post-conciliar era. I think it would be a mistake to assume this is just a matter of healthy progress away from the censor censorious approach of the past. Censorship is, after all, a venerable prerogative of the Catholic Church going back to the Acts of the Apostles. And if you had to pick which approach has more continuity with the church teaching and the saints of the past 2,000 years, it would pretty clearly be the Legion of Decency. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that the new approach of the Vatican film list is entirely bad, but it does mean we should see it in the context of church teaching and think about how it can be synthesized with uh, what was best in the practices of the past. Read charitably, the list is not an exercise in moral indifferentism, but in learning to appreciate what is good and even morally flawed works of art along the lines of St. Basil the Great's Address to Young Men on the Right Use of Greek Literature. And as the title, Some Important Films, indicates, there are certain films and filmmakers which just can't be avoided if you want to understand what film has been and can be. Nonetheless, I've noticed among some Catholic art people a kind of exaggerated anti-Philistinism, which if it doesn't go so far as to say out loud that anything is permissible for the sake of art, at least seems to consider the judgment of moral content to be beneath the notice of urbane art lovers, as though obscenity were at most a faux pas that it would be impolite to comment on. This is not the attitude of the church, as we can see from a speech given by Pope St. John Paul II for the same 100th anniversary of cinema that occasioned the Vatican film list. After giving an overall positive judgment of the art of cinema and its capacity for spiritual depth, St. John Paul added the following, Unfortunately, though, some cinema productions merit criticism and disapproval, even severe criticism and disapproval. This is the case when films distort the truth, oppress genuine freedom, or show scenes of sex and violence offensive to human dignity. Here, at least, there is total continuity with the preconciliar approach. For example, Venerable Pope Pius XII, in addition to his very interesting ap apostolic exhortation titled The Ideal Film, also wrote an encyclical about mass communications titled Miranda Prorsus, a section of which specifically addresses the obligation of Catholic film critics. Quote, in this area, Catholic motion picture critics can exert a great deal of influence if they set moral issues in their proper perspective by championing those principles which will prevent a decline into what is called relative morality or an overthrow of that right order of things in which less important issues are subordinated to more important ones. It is quite wrong then for Catholic mag magazines and newspapers not to give their readers a moral appraisal of the motion pictures that they review. All this provides important guidance for engaging with films, including those on the Vatican film list. It is of course extremely important for Catholic critics to highlight form and aesthetics rather than reducing works to their intellectual and moral themes. Much less should we think the task of moral discernment can be reduced to the enumeration of offensive content. But we also shouldn't fear the bugbear of Puritanism to the point where we shame the pure-minded person who points out where, where a film has violated the moral law rather than shaming the filmmaker who has violated it. Uh, those are my suggestive thoughts on what Catholic filmmakers, viewers, and critics might gain from the Vatican film list. My hope is that those who take an interest in the list will not only dip into it, but persevere long enough to be changed by it, especially through repeat viewings of the films they may find difficult. What may begin for someone as cinematic tourism will ideally lead to feeling at home in a far more expansive world. I hope that filmmakers in particular will use the list to get a sense of what has been done well and what has been done poorly in religious cinema, not just as a superficial film school survey, 
but as a jumping off point for sustained personal study and a much deeper vision for the Catholic films of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Our second speaker is Nathan Douglas, uh, who is a filmmaker and writer based in Vancouver, British Columbia. His short films have screened internationally at the Locarno Film Festival, Claremont Ferrand International Short Film Festival, and the Festival du, <laughs> du Nouveau Cinema in Montreal. Should have practiced my French. <laughs> and the Vancouver International <coughs> Film Festival. His writing on cinema can be found in Dappled Things at his, and at his substack, The Vocation of Cinema. He's a regular contributor to Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast. And the title of his um, is The Filmmaker as Auteur. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, just a little preamble, uh, our wonderful host, Justin Petrasek, caught me last night making some uh, adjustments to what I'm about to share with you. And he assured me that this is a place that appreciates half-baked thoughts, <laughs> which uh, I hope this isn't half-baked, but it might be medium rare, so. <laughs> My role on this panel is to offer a filmmaker's perspective on the Vatican film list. So. What does the Vatican film list suggest to filmmakers? One thing that leaps out to me is how much the list testifies to the diversity of forms which are possible in cinema. By forms, I mean all the ways in which a film may come into existence, all the ways that a camera can look at a certain thing, all the ways that an editor can sculpt images into a meaningful sequence. There is no one-size-fits-all method for making a film. And the benefit of having a list like this, as well as a comfortable historical vantage, is how it allows us to see the great range of beautiful and particular forms which occur at any given point of film history. The fact of this diversity of form is, show, is thrown into sharp relief, however, when we consider how often the vast majority of mainstream cinema and television we consume in our own era stays within a certain systematic consistency of form. I'm speaking of flat and direct camera angles of characters all occupying their own frames, such as you'd see in just about every television show out there this, these days. Floods of lighting that banish all shadows, editing rhythms designed to maximize short attention spans, music which functions like wallpaper, present enough to notice that it's keeping us safe from the terrible threat of silence. But, speaking of silence, <laughs> not good enough to really enjoy for its own sake. How did we become used to so much pablum? Catholic audiences are no strangers to critiquing mis mainstream fare on the quality of, of its subject matter, but we hardly ever seem to notice how equally poor the form is. The problem is all too common in Catholic and other Christian media cultures as well. It is somewhat galling every time we beat our drums about the church's role as the source of the West's astonishing patrimony of beauty and how much we need to recover lost forms and lost ways of making, only to hear crickets as soon as the cinema comes into view. What this tells me is that there is a crisis in Catholic film culture, sorry, if there is a crisis in Catholic film culture, it is a crisis of poetic cinema, of films that reach for the highest and deepest things in ways, forms that are adequate to that task. Everywhere you look in Catholic media, you will find works, whether fiction or nonfiction, which hew to the established commercial forms of our day as though they are somehow the objective standard for good image making. We seem to have forgotten that commercial standards of filmmaking, while they have their own particular beauty that deserves to be acknowledged, are always adapting to whatever the market demands. And what the market demands is usually most expedient, what is most expedient to keep audiences paying. They are not and never have been an objective aesthetic criterion that originates from the heights of poetic beauty. At best, they represent a kind of via media between mercenary interests and spectacular forms. And above all, we know them by their impersonality, their anonymity, their sense of having no real soul or reason to exist than pure functionality. Now, I don't mean to sound completely clueless, 
The reality of our predicament is complicated. Catholics are not yet completely outcast from mainstream culture, and there will always be compelling reasons, if not necessarily good ones, to collaborate with secular and commercial opportunities to make pleasing images for a wide audience. Further, it's undeniable that, in spite of my probably harsh words above, there is a real appeal, a real beauty, and a pleasing efficiency to be found in most commercial forms. This is not nothing and, and may indeed have its uses. My objection is to its dominance over our imaginations. Finally, the history of cinema is short, and unlike the schools of painting and architecture and music, there is no meaningful school or historically stable style which we can point to as an obviously Catholic cinematic form. This is partly because the cinema has never had and never will have a properly liturgical function. So in a very real sense, the forms which filmmakers make have no sensibly religious component, even if they always have a sensibly moral and sapiential component. If there is no such thing as a Catholic style in cinema, and we cannot really hold commercial forms as our highest standard, where does that leave Catholic filmmakers who desire to give themselves in making good, true, and beautiful films? In one sense, it leaves them in a place of profound freedom. We're not obligated to use only this or that style as our starting point. We're free to make, to form, as we see fit, obviously with the obligation to remain within the moral boundaries of Catholic teaching. In, a, in another sense, though, perhaps we find this freedom intimidating, even paralyzing. Perhaps we are so used to copying the world's patterns of systematized forms to know where to begin ourselves. What remains to us? Nothing less than the whole system, sorry. <clears throat> so what remains to us? Nothing less than the whole history of cinema and its dazzling multiplicity of forms. Out of this multitude, with the aid of canons like the Vatican Film List, we may gain a sense of the possibilities available to each filmmaker to find his or her own way of seeing, way of forming, way of bringing into existence. Before we go further though, I think it would help to consider the vocational dynamic of the filmmaker's desire to make. What is God's intention for permitting the cinema to exist? If he has willed from all time that I live in this period of history and experience this attraction to the poetic potential of moving images, what does that mean for my life and my work? Whatever our situation, each of us, at least each of us filmmakers, must ask, what am I called to offer? It is a question which animates the church's very thought on the fundamental nature of cinema itself, which after the Second Vatican Council, somewhat unceremoniously lumped cinema in with television, radio, and other forms of new media under the broad heading of communication. In some ways, it was a step back from the medium-specific philosophical work that the magisterium undertook before the council, but with the gain of providing clarity about the deeper theological meaning of the moving image. In the 1972 pastoral instruction, Communio et Progressio, which was written to guide the implementation of the council's teaching on social communications, including cinema, we find perhaps the most succinct theological statement about all moving images ever written. Quote, communication is more than the expression of ideas and the indication of emotion. At its most profound level, it is the giving of self in love. This question has a unique cadence for the filmmaker as it does for every artist or communicator, indeed for every action in which God calls us to give ourselves in a unique way. I ask this with my fellow filmmakers here today. How do I give myself as a filmmaker? What gift am I being asked to give as a filmmaker? And this is the question which lies at the heart of our desire for a truly Catholic cinematic form. If we return to the Vatican film list, what we find on the list again and again are certain names, the names of many masters of cinema. Reading them conjures up certain memories and images. Kubrick, Wells, Renoir, Bergman, Tarkovsky, Spielberg, Kurosawa, and on we could go. For the cinephile, the type of viewer who loves the cinema for its own sake, these names are a sure gateway to seeing moving images that far exceed those we experience in our mundane day-to-day -day lives. For the filmmaker in search of form, 
Each of these directors offers a distinctive personal example of a way of seeing which has been given a unique form in matter. What do we see in these personal ways of seeing and being? Again and again, a kind of virtue or stylistic control, a sense of intentionality, and a distinctiveness from other filmmakers' styles. The more that we encounter different ways of seeing, the more we become awake to the boundless fecundity of the moving image. And this is the point where it is necessary to bring up the concept of the auteur, a much debated idea in film theory, which has never quite been settled intellectually, and yet is more or less tacitly accepted by cinephile culture. So, what is an auteur? I imagine some, maybe all of you have probably encountered this before, so maybe this will be a review, but originating in 1950s France and taking the French word for author, auteur traditionally means uh, a filmmaker who is perceived to have left a trace or imprint of his or her personal presence in the film itself, such that their films and their filmmaking as a whole, their way of seeing, emerges as uniquely identifiable and unrepeatable, even if it might be imitated. The auteur is a kind of complete author of a film who leaves his stamp through the way he arranges mise-en-scene. We'll come back to what that means in a sec. All, basically all of the elements in the frame. The film historian and theorist Paul Villman has summarized the cinephilic gaze which gave rise to auteurism as one which sees something beyond the merely sensible. The cinephilic act, he says, culminates in the conviction of, quote, a realization that what is being seen is in excess of what is being shown, end quote. Further, he says, quote, it reveals an aspect or dimension of a person, whether it's the actor or the director, which is not choreographed for you to see. It is produced en plus, in excess or in addition, almost involuntarily. In other words, one sees beyond visible forms, sees with the full sweep of its inner power of vision, a glimpse of being itself. Indeed, even more than only being, it sees the being of a person. What made this revelation even more, sorry, I should add, uh, what Villeman is describing, this is, is the fundamental movement in 1950s French cinephilic culture towards uh, uh, under, uh, encountering these, uh, the, the, the person of the director, this was happening in the 50s, but the concept, you know, once it was kind of made aware to the rest of the world, you know, we've seen this dynamic happen over and over since. What made this revelation even more astonishing was the fact that it was taking place in the experience of films that came out of the highly efficient machine that was the classical Hollywood system, and in films by directors who did not consider themselves artists in the same sense that you'd find in the great man or genius directors of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, figures like Abel Gantz, Eric von Stroheim, Fritz Lang, F.W. Murnau, and Orson Welles, and so on. Directors who entered into their work, these are directors who entered into their work with a keen sense of the control necessary to realize their full vision. They were directors somewhat consciously in the lineage of the romantic tradition of the poet prophet, of Wagner and the Gesamtkunstwerk, or the total work of art, of the divinely gifted artists mediating profundity to the masses. They were directors aware of their authorship. The greatest discovery of the original auteurist experience was that they detected the trace of the personal in works which were not intended to be integral personal artistic statements, and yet they still disclosed a unique integrity which derived from a unique personality. Even within the confines of an industrialized system designed to obviate personal desire and intention, the personal nature of acting, of forming, still communicates itself. For the auteurists, the particular ground where the, where the person of the director becomes visible in film is in what we call mise-en-scene. It's uh, a term that really has no counterpart in English, uh, but essentially means the arranging of the elements in the film or the arranging of the elements in, in the frame. Everything within the frame or relevant to it, all matter, all actions, Color, actors, sets, music, camera movements, all of that is mise-en-scene. Whether it is artificially made on a soundstage or taken completely from real life on location, 
whether a director fusses over every detail or simply lets it all be as, as their other collaborators have said it, they're exercising their sovereign rule over the whole integral form of the film. Now, something very special happens when a filmmaker experiences for, uh, the inadvertent disclosure of personal being in a film, has the cinephilic experience, and realizes the full implications of the auteur's dis discovery. He becomes aware of his power to inform the matter which he's taken as his basis for making a film, not only for the sake of some function, but if he so chooses, purely for his own arbitrary reasons. In such a moment, the filmmaker glimpses a kind of freedom which is intoxicating in the extreme because it is the freedom proper to poetry, the freedom to appropriate ordinary things and shape them with absolute confidence into something significant. In the hands of a, of a mature poet, ordinary words, even ordinary syllables, are plucked from their everyday uses to become signs, symbols, to bear meaning other than their own. Sim <coughs> similarly, in the hands of a mature filmmaker, ordinary things, frankly, all that is in nature, or at least all that can be photographed, are not so much plucked or reshaped, for the camera has no hands, but reseen, regarded anew, first in the eye of the filmmaker, and then again, as he constitutes it in the eye of the camera. To speak of this revivified way of seeing, a kind of sight which will never again be unaware of the potential of things before its eyes, is to evoke a concept so beloved of the, uh, by the medievals, which is that of the visio. That vision which, as Umberto Eco reminds us, is not only the sense of sight, or only the imagination, or only the use of reason, but all three in a unified act. Uh, for those who want the, the philosophical definition he gives, which I think is pretty cool, uh, he says, it's an aesthetic actuation of an ontological perfection. For anyone who wishes to make, for, excuse me, for anyone who wishes to make the visio, the act of seeing and judging, is the necessary preliminary to compositio, the act of arranging or forming in the imagination which precedes or unfolds simultaneously with an artistic activity. When the visio of the filmmaker beholds the material of mise-en-scene, a kind of material awaiting the form which will reconstitute it as artistic matter, that, excuse me, I'm gonna start that again. When the visio of the filmmaker beholds the material of mise-en-scene, which, which is a kind of material awaiting the form which will reconstitute it as artistic matter, and this visio also senses the potentialities awaiting her hand, her hand, she begins to hunger to more fully draw out that good, to realize it in a completed fashion. Put another way, the personal mark of the filmmaker left in the mise-en-scene of a film is uh, this constant kind of, it's this constant shaping and, and, and um, yeah, that's probably just good to leave that there. <laughs> what forms a, so this leads us to a question. What forms a visio? This seems like easy enough to answer. Formal training, so exposure to varieties of form to understand what, uh, what kinds of forms are possible. Moral training is an obvious one as well. But most important is spiritual training, constant immersion in God through personal prayer, the liturgy, and the sacraments. Indeed, the whole point of the visio is so that God may use your gifts, especially your gift of sight, in a way that will help another. This, I think, is the primary calling of the filmmaker, the essence of our particular path of communication, of self-gift. It's not to convey mere information, but to inform with self, in a way. This is what the filmmaker has to offer, what constitutes the particular nature of their gift of self to give the gift of his visio, his way of seeing, something which before the existence of the cinema could only be shared, veiled in symbols and abstractions and analogies. We might muse on why this is, perhaps because man in his, moder his modernity has grown tired of signs and symbols, and even in our day, tired of abstractions. All that we have left to ourselves is brute reality, the unfiltered moment, the unformed moment. Yes, the greatest gift a filmmaker has to give is twofold. 
First, the offering of their own visio, their, their way of seeing, which we could also say is how one receives the things of, ma- of nature, realized in a particular way through their process of compositio, how one rearranges nature. The classical doctrine of autourism reminds us that this gift can still be given even in chains, even when the filmmaking process is subordinated to lower ends, but only if the filmmaker is integrated and free enough to do so. This freedom includes a careful balancing of collaboration and dictation, of incorporating the gifts of others to collaborate in the truest sense without losing that visio or appropriating another's in its place, either be it by being conquered by more powerful influences, even passions, or uh, we could say vices. This, I think, is the closest we can get to a kind of truly Catholic film form and truly Catholic autourism. It is a kind of form that is always, always fertile and sensitive to reality and as unrepeatable as the persons and visios from which it emanates. It can be, only be activated by seeing beyond the surface as a cinephile does, in seeing, becoming receptive to the revelation of personality, of gift of self, the gift of visio, which unlocks in the filmmaker the potential to more intentionally inform his own work, his own mise-en-scene with love. The revelation of being in cinema, like all encounters with being, provokes a desire to respond to this gift by giving oneself in turn. To be clear, the act of sharing one's regard through a camera is is also an act of communication which is removed from the source. It's still an act that requires a medium. We cannot directly communicate ourselves to each other on this side of eternal life. With every act of arranging the elements under his view, the filmmaker takes the insight, the posture, the sensibility of his visio and turns it to compositio. In doing so, he communicates his visio to others who being receptive to being are themselves actuated, awakened to some dimension of his personhood. A glimpse which for them leaps joyfully down to the very roots of our being. Indeed, a glimpse which having traveled down that long tunnel at light speed is met by infinitely more delighted eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and our third speaker is Andrew uh, Petaprin, uh, who is the founder of the Space Salvi Institute, a columnist at Catholic World Report and host of the Ignatius Press podcast. He is co-author of the book Popcorn with the Pope, a guide to the Vatican film list, and author of the forthcoming book, What the Catholic Church is Not. Andrew was formerly fellow of popular culture at the Word on Fire Institute and a British Marshall Scholar at Magdalen College, Oxford. He was an Anglican cleric before coming into full communion with the Catholic Church. And the title of his talk is Europe for Everyone. Yesterday, Vatican, F- Yesterday, Vatican Film List and Catholic Imagination Today. Oh, I see. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, it's an honor and a joy to be here, and I know you could be watching a UFO movie right now, so it is uh, a, real, uh, a real honor that you decided to come and listen to us. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thomas mentioned in his talk that um, the Vatican film list is uh, overwhelmingly European in, in character, <clears throat> and for various reasons that's the case. One of the things that my co-authors and I of our book, Popcorn with the Pope, talk about in our introduction is how clearly those who compiled the list were interested in providing a sort of like representative sample of some of the great European uh, cinematic masters. Excuse me a second. So for example, there are two films from Fellini, two films from Bergman, two films from Rossellini, two from Carl Theodore Dreyer, and two from Tarkovsky. I mean, you could really put all of the films or almost all of the films of all of those directors on a list of some important films, right? So for whatever reason, they just chose two. But then again, there are no films by Eric Romare. There are no films by Andre Vida. There are no films by Godard, no films by Truffaut, right? So, I mean, it's an odd collection of European films to begin with. Um, that said, when you look at the, the whole list, 
thinking about the European ones, the kind of art house ones that when the list came out in the 90s, Americans would have had to like go to some obscure kind of you know, college town video store to try and find, right? Nowadays you can stream all of these things and it's, it's completely different. But one of, the, one of the things that stands out about the list is that of course The Wizard of Oz is an interesting movie and Fantasia is an interesting movie and um, you know, Stagecoach, there are all kinds of things on there, but no one would argue, right, that Dreyer's Ordet or Tarkovsky's Andrei Rublev or Bergman's Seventh Seal, that those are the films that convey the deepest kind of philosophical, theological, metaphysical, etc. I mean, those are the films that you really want to watch if you're, you know, kind of want to have a mature experience of kind of relating to um, spiritual, spiritual issues, religious issues, whatever you want to call it. So, one of the questions then, you know, 30 years after the Vatican film list that always comes up, that comes up a lot when I talk about our, our book is, if you were to do another list today, what would you put on it? That's just kind of one of those fun exercises that cinephiles, Catholic cinephiles like to do. <coughs> and a sub-question would be, would there be as many, would there be as high a percentage of European films on a second part of the list, a kind of post-1990 or 19... I say 1990 because there is only one film from the 1990s on the Vatican film list, and that's Schindler's List. So, I, I mean, I, to me, my kind of part two has to start at 1990, it, personally. Um, and one of the most important reasons for that is that's when the Cold War came to an end, more or less, right? So when I answer the question, should there be as high a percentage of European films on a part two of a list as part one, I say, yes, absolutely, in fact, even more so. And here's why I say that. I say that because even though Europe has become supposedly more secular than us here in America where we have still a kind of respectability about church going and higher levels of church attendance or something like that, there's a shallowness that we have detected, both, both my co-panelists have kind of touched on this a little bit today, uh, a shallowness in, in the cinema that has been produced. So for example, I think a case could be made that you could have actually put an American blockbuster like Raiders of the Lost Ark or E.T. on the original Vatican film list. However, I don't think any like, kind of respectable cinephile would say that you would put Avatar or The Avengers on a part two of a Vatican film list, right? So I, I think that a, a huge gulf has, has uh, sort of continued to widen. So I've totally gone off script, so I'm going to try and figure out where to, where to pick up so I can tell you about some movies that are not on the Vatican film list, <coughs> but uh, are maybe of interest. Okay, I already mentioned Andrei Tarkovsky, who's got two films on the list. Um, but to defend my position about this like persistent philosophical and theological depth of European cinema, oh yeah, that's the point I forgot to make, European cinema continues to have this philosophical depth. Somehow, American cinema seems to be falling off in this way, Europe not so, even though Europe is um, more secular, uh, at least that's our perception here from America. But I want to talk briefly about a Tarkovsky film that did not make the Vatican film list, sadly, his penultimate film from 1983, Nostalgia. Nostalgia. Um, in May of 1980, Andrei Tarkovsky was in Rome preparing his script for this film, Nostalgia, when he ventured into a papal audience in St. Peter's Square. He related his experience in his diary. By the way, Tarkovsky's diary is a great read. I really think you all ought to get a copy of that if you don't have it. But anyway, he says about this experience of wandering into St. Peter's Square, quote, it's odd that although I was surrounded simply by large numbers of curious people, such as foreigners and tourists, there was a unity about them which impressed me deeply. There was something natural, organic in it all." End quote. Now, as a Soviet, a Soviet citizen and an artist who was always on the defensive about how to express himself freely, I mean, Tarkovsky um, didn't defect or anything, but he did leave the Soviet Union in order to make his last couple of films. Um, but he was particularly interested to note that, quote, it was obvious that all these people had come here of their own free will. That's an interesting kind of observation that I think an American would not have made, right? To see people worshiping, um, we would just be like, oh, well, they're just there, right? But he, he thought it was really interesting that that's what, they, that's what they chose to do. And he wrote in his diary that he looked forward to going back to Moscow and telling people about what he saw in St. Peter's. I believe that there's no doubt this experience of hearing Pope John Paul II alongside a throng of pious Catholics and spiritually curious wanderers helped shape the final form of the film Nostalgia. This film forces us to contemplate the idea of keeping the flame of Christianity burning despite all odds, 
as the Western world continues to transform in ways as varied as economic turmoil, um, aesthetic poverty, and you know, family collapse, all kinds of things that we could talk about. Trying to keep Christianity alive requires the heroic self-sacrifice of those with eyes to see, as represented by the, the memorable climax of Nostalgia, where the protagonist, Andre, carries a candle across a pool and then dies. Um, it's great. you got to see it if you haven't seen it. But then there's a scene after that, the final scene, where we see how the mark of faith endures as the camera pulls back to show the protagonist, Andre, again, this time sitting inside the ruins of a Western-style abbey as Russian music plays. The point that I think Tarkovsky is making is that whether modern Europeans, or Americans for that matter, recognize it or not, their future existence is a form of nostalgia, life among the ruins, which inspires a painful desire for a spiritual home despite official anti-clericalism, secularism, or negligence. I'm gonna make this point a little more with a couple more films now. In 1987, seven years after Tarkovsky's revelation in St. Peter's Square, the West German director Wim Wenders depicted angels keeping watch over a still divided Europe in his masterpiece Der Himmel über Berlin, which is, um, literally means heaven over Berlin, but it's infelicitously, I think, translated into English as wings of desire. Desire certainly is an important thing that goes on in that movie, but I think the kind of the image of the you know, angels over Berlin is, is better. Anyway, looking out for the countless souls during one of the last grim winters of the Cold War, an angel named Damiel, played by Bruno Ganz, becomes a human in order to pursue a French acrobat named Marion. It's unorthodox angelology, but um, you know, so is It's a Wonderful Life. There, it's unorthodox, <laughs> unorthodox angelology is very good for cinema, I think, to be honest. Anyway, in, in Vendor's film, which unfortunately is also not included on the Vatican film list, we see in retrospect that he anticipated the changes that were coming to Europe, and by extension the world that had looked to Europe for decades as the battleground between the first world of democratic capitalism and the second world of totalitarian communism. In this middle ground lurked the Christian spirit that had made its way up from Jerusalem to the historic patriarchates of Rome in the west and later Moscow in the east. As Marion explains to Damiel in the film's final scene, she says, quote, we incarnate something. I believe that she is referring to Europe and Europeans in that, in that line. Um, since another character in, in the film, another former angel, you find out, spoiler, but whatever, who cares about spoilers, um, Peter Falk uh, from Colombo, he, he plays another former angel, but he's depicted as a new world man who returns to the old world to play a part in, 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 the, in a movie that he's been cast in. And it's there returning to the old world where he rediscovers this sense of enchantment that he never had as a human living in the new world. So I do really think that there's this sense of we incarnate something meaning Europeans, like this sort of Europeanness to Christianity. Anyway, Wings of Desires is one example of, of the spiritual, pre presents one example of the spiritual themes that would proliferate in some of the best European films in the years following the end of the Cold War. Let me talk about another one now, before I run out of time. Um, the one I want to talk about now is uh, Danish director Lars von Trier's 1990 Kafkaesque drama Europa. Lars von Trier, by the way, was, uh, is an adult convert to Catholicism, although I don't know currently what is sort of, uh, how, how the, I don't know the fullness of his communion at the moment, but anyway. Um, uh, in Europa, um, which is clearly aesthetically influenced by both Tarkovsky and Wenders, um, I think Lars von Trier proposes something similar to what would appear two years later in the work of Remy Brague um, in his little book called Europe la voie romaine, translated into English as eccentric culture. Namely, that Europe is a culture that transcends its continental limitations. It's a way of life that has adapted and exported itself, undergirded by a Christianity that was itself an adaptation and an, imp and an import. Joseph Ratzinger said the same thing many, many times as well. And I'll just um, provide one quote um, that reflects his thought on that. In 2004, shortly before his election as Pope Benedict XVI, he said, quote, Europe is not a continent that can be comprehended neatly in geographical terms. Rather, it is a cultural and historical concept. Lars von Trier said much the same thing. In 1991, he said about the making of his film Europa, quote, Europe has been the destination of my dreams. 
which is a really odd thing for someone like Lars von Trier to say because he not only was born in Denmark, but to my knowledge has never left the continent of Europe because he is deathly afraid of flying. Um, so kind of an odd thing that he would talk about Europe as being a destination of his dreams since he had never actually been anywhere else. Let me skip a little bit because I'm going to run out of time. Um, all right, so for an American filmgoer, the opening of Trier's movie, Europa, uh, this dream letter to his home continent, invites a kind of voyeurism, like, like we're tourists going, going to Europe. We find ourselves on railway tracks as if looking out from the front of a speeding train. And then we hear the voice of Max von Sydow, uh, an alumnus of, of Bergman, uh, you know, most famous kind of Swedish actor of all time. And again, like, if an American knows a Swedish actor, it's Max von Sydow, right? So, of course, like, that's the voice that we're going to hear in this, in this dream letter. And he introduces the film as an invitation into hypnosis. He says, on the count of ten, you will be in Europa. We then meet the main character, Leopold Kessler, who is played by the Franco-American actor Jean-Marc Barre. Kessler is an American of German parentage who has returned to his family's native Germany just after the fall of the Nazis, with Germany in chaos and Berlin still up for grabs by the winners of the war. Kessler, I'll just skip a little bit, Kessler is, is sort of extremely naive. He is not a religious person. He's asked about his religion. And he is praised by this kind of former Nazi industrialist guy, Max Hartmann, for, um, for not giving in to superstition. But you kind of get the sense from this character, this Max Hartmann character, that he just kind of wants to go along with the kind of Americanization of Europe so that he can basically not go to jail, not get executed, not lose his shirt. In fact, he's going to be the sort of person in the new Germany who's going to get very, very rich because of the Marshall Plan and the reinvigoration of the European economy. But there are other characters in the film that don't tow that line. And one of them is um, this guy, Max Hartmann's son, Lawrence, who's played by Udo Kier, who he turns up in a lot of Lars von Trier movies. Now, he, uh, he admits, this guy, uh, uh, Lawrence, he admits that the church is, quote, a sophisticated waste, uh, but only to those without eyes to see. Uh, when a priest later encourages Kessler, the American, to attend midnight mass in a bombed out church, which is, in my mind, an obvious homage to the last scene of Nostalgia, he decides to go, finding himself, himself enraptured by the natural religion of snowfall and candlelight, but also by the traditional liturgy that's happening far above him at the altar. If you have not seen Europa, at least find that scene. It is incredible, incredible scene. Later on, Kessler's uncle concedes that, quote, priests are a necessary discomfort in Europe, and there's this general sense when you get to the end of the movie that the church is simply hard to get rid of. And it's uh, emphasized by the fact that the, the very, very end of the movie, it's back to the hypnosis thing again, and Max von Sydow's voice, who wakes us up, or tries to wake us up, and he says, quote, you want to wake up to free yourself from the image of Europa, but it is not possible. Um, so, that I think is kind of where I approach then European cinema from 1990 onwards. That, you know, as Pierre Menon talks about the mark of faith, um, you know, there, this mark is just really, really hard to eradicate, even by people who are trying to do it. Um, if you've seen Fellini's Eight and a Half, you know that the kind of the turmoil of, of Guido in trying to make the film that he wants to make there is he wants to make an anti-Catholic film. But the film critic actually says to him, like, you're not going to succeed. You're going to end up making something that's sort of too nostalgic and that, you know, in a sense kind of, um, kind of idealizes your, your, your ancestral faith in some way. And I would argue, actually, that's what Eight and a Half kind of does. Um, anyway, so we're running out of time. But among things that we ought to be thinking about, um, I had a whole thing about Eric Romare. Don't have time to talk about that. Um, if we were going to have a second part to the, the Vatican film list now, um, we would definitely include people, in my opinion, like the Dardenne brothers of Belgium. Uh, if you don't know their movies, you, you, really ought to, you really ought to check those out. They grew up in a middle class family, a uh, very strong Catholic family. To my knowledge, they're no longer practicing their faith. I'm not really sure. But their realist films are complex and humane expressions of Catholic social teaching. To my mind, far better than the facile moralizing that you get when an American filmmaker sort of tries to do that sort of thing. 
Um, moreover, the Dardenne brothers are professed disciples of the Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who was among the strongest intellectual influences on Pope John Paul II. In fact, George Weigel told me when, I was, when we were doing the research for the Popcorn with the Pope book that, to his knowledge, he couldn't remember John Paul II watching any movies other than Life is Beautiful by Roberto Benigni, another one that definitely should be on part two of the Vatican film list. Instead, he said, JP2 liked to curl up in bed with Levinas. That's, that's what he told me, so I don't know. Um, I think I'm just about out of time, I don't know, but... Um, no, you've got four minutes. Four minutes, okay, excellent. Um, among, the, among all of the Dardenne brothers' wonderful films, the one that I like the best, personally, is their 2002 film, The Sun, The Feast, um, which kind of makes the point that, um, uh, bo I think both of my colleagues have, have sort of made here, uh, maybe Thomas more so, um, sort of about the way that religion is kind of conveyed. Um, well, actually, Thomas and I were just talking yesterday about how you will sometimes encounter people, I think, coming from a place of good faith, like from like Catholics commenting, for example, on, on a secular film. And they will want to kind of imagine a kind of Christ-like shape, a, a sort of a, a Christ figure or something like in an, in an Avengers movie or something like that. And I, for my part, that's just extremely tiresome. I, I you know... But this, this movie, Le Fils, The Son, by, uh, by the Dardenne brothers, has these obvious sort of expressions of things that come from, from religion. Um, and yet, it sort of ultimately comes across in a way that doesn't feel like you're just sort of like, you know, applying some kind of false uh, hermeneutic or whatever to your interpretation of it. Um, I, I'm going to run out of time, so I won't, I won't go into that anymore. But... Um, anyway, uh, I want to end with another, another um, European director who I think uh, would have to be included on part two, and that's Paolo Sorrentino. Some of you probably have seen The Great Beauty, which is a movie that um, a lot of people have commented on. I made a little video about it when I worked at Word on Fire, actually. I think it's a brilliant movie. I think that the two series that he did for HBO, The Young Pope and The New Pope, are, are also excellent. I, I, I really do like them a lot. But there's another movie that doesn't get a lot of attention, um, and that's his 2021 film, The Hand of God. And so let me just end with a word of appreciation about it and why I think this is the kind of thing that Americans don't do and um, you know, st still conveys a real depth of, of faith. So the movie's called The Hand of God. If you're a soccer fan, if you've seen this movie, then you know what I'm talking about, but if you, don't, if you haven't, if you're a soccer fan, The Hand of God refers to Diego Maradona's miraculous goal that he scored, I mean, completely illegal goal that he scored at the 1986 World Cup against England. The main character in, in, um, in this movie, The Hand of God, is a, um, is a great soccer fan. He loves Diego Maradona, and his dream is that Diego Maradona will come and play for his local team, Napoli. Um, are we out of time? I'm sorry. Two, Two minutes. Okay, excellent. Um, let, me, let me race on ahead. Um, but this sense of hand of God is a much deeper and, and kind of um, more profound thing, actually, than just a, just a soccer reference. The protagonist, Fabietto, is navigating the confusion of puberty in a large loving family that includes various black sheep that fascinate him. But then he suffers the tragic loss of his parents, and all of the comfort he has known vanishes. My reading of his experience is uh, very much along the lines of what Father Luigi Giussani calls elementary experience, that he has this sort of awakening to the world as a creature of God, and he's afraid of it. He, he wants to run away from reality when, in fact, what he's invited into is like a, an encounter with reality. And that's exactly what happens to him when he meets a film director. He thinks he wants to become a film director so that he can escape. And I would argue that, you know, your typical American film is kind of geared towards a sort of escapism. This European director, how, however, that Fabietto meets when he tells him, I don't like reality anymore, um, he, tells him, um, he, he tells him to, to stay put and to take a, a step essentially deeper into the real. The rest of Fabietto's story, I think, is, uh, again, to, to um, quote Gisani, is uh, something like the beginning of liberation. It's like a conversion, really, even though the film ends and he isn't running off to go get baptized and receive the Eucharist or anything like that, um, but I think conveys this uh, very deep and profound kind of spiritual awakening. Anyway, let me end. My point is that European cinema still does a manful job, maybe even unwittingly at times, showing us how the hand of God is always at work. The mark of Christ in the church is simply too strong, and we have every reason to believe that in cinema it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. But I think American filmmakers need to take note. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Andrew. Uh, <clears throat> all of our speakers were very good at keeping to the time, so we do have probably about 10 minutes for Q&A, and I'll field them, and then you can answer them. And of course, we do like um, somewhat interactive uh, discussion, so if a, a question is addressed to one person, the others should feel free to also jump in and say something. So, up here in front. First of all, thanks to each of you for wonderful compelling papers. Um, so much to think about. Uh, I'd like to get uh, a word from each of you, if you will, about what steps Catholic cinephiles can take to unite and help build uh, a robust culture of Catholic film criticism uh, in this sort of post Catholic Someone like to start? Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, there's many different answers, as many answers as there are individual people and gifts. But um, I, I think what stands out to me is one thing I focused on at the outset is just openness, being open to different kinds of, of films. I think there's a real problem with just the kind of the narrowness of of taste. I, I would actually say to to like think of your your own personal taste as less important in a way than whether something is just good or not. Um, uh, because we, we just, we, we, we trap ourselves in our, own, in our own personalities in a way, but we should be entering into the real. Um, but uh, yeah, openness and, and another thing I stressed in my talk, like form yourself deeply in the, the Catholic tradition because there's a lot of, um, there, there's, always been too much of this divide in, in recent decades between like, you know, sort of the pious Orthodox Catholics and then the sort of like artistic Catholics who really are maybe not as concerned with the faith as they should be. So I think that that gap needs to be continually, you know, broken through. Uh, my answer would be, um there needs th there is a real lack of culture, uh, intellectual culture, uh, that is setting the standard for this is how you this is how cinephiles should engage with film in a serious manner. And as Thomas was saying, you know, dealing with questions of uh, if it just doesn't meet my taste, you know, still being able to go into objectively look at it. And to, and you know, I've, my t paper is about form, so I'm all about the form. I, <laughs> there's very little formal uh, criticism. Uh, in you know Catholic film discourse, um, which makes it hard for the filmmakers because we're out here. All we do is really, we're not only thinking about form, but you know that's mostly what we think about. That's that's our job, um, and so to have uh, the community be more uh, engaged with it, more with, you know interested in how form works, and communicating that. Like, the main thing I would say is like communicating with each other. Uh, even if that's you know blogging, things like the French New Wave came out of community happening. It was, it was you know people talking to each other after screenings, and and they were all in a one you know geographical space for the most part, which helped a lot. But we we have the internet, you know, so there's a lot we can do just even to hang out and share ideas um, that can be very very effective. Um, yeah, I'll just say really quickly, I just to kind of build actually on what Thomas said. I I am. Um, Actually, Thomas himself has, has helped me actually um, maybe keep a, keep a closer eye on, like maybe my, my style is maybe a little loosey gooseyer, uh, you know, maybe a little more, uh, I don't know, like less concerned with, say, sex and nudity in a movie, for example, or like whatever. And, and I think it's important for someone like me to like really keep in, keep in mind that there might actually be things in certain movies that aren't, that aren't so good. So um, I, I think like just the kind of like, you know, mutual respect, openness, like sort of understanding of each other's kind of perspectives as we're like approaching the, these issues is um, something that I would, you know, I would advocate. Um, back over here, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have about 10 questions. <laughs> yeah. How about half of a question? Got their funding and how much they relied on 
French state for funding. Uh, but I'd be curious to get the sort of an answer on that. But also, like, what what are some of the practical sort of obstacles that you think the Catholic filmmakers today face on, on that level? Like, what will the funding mechanisms be how, in this really capital-intensive Hollywood ethos? How can you, you know, make films? Do you have to do you have to aim for really low-budget pictures? Um, do you have to make short films? Do, we, do you need to option uh, Catholic writers short stories? You know, yeah. Yeah, you, that's, that's you, you, you hit the. This is. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do my oil. This is the. I'm gonna try not to do the oil rig breaking. But um, basically, uh, and it's funny. I'm Canadian, so I'm in a different cultural context. I can't speak specifically to the American thing, but a lot of that is is similar in, where I'm from. Uh, from what I can see, uh, to answer the question of the financing, I'm convinced it's going to take deep pocketed, big hearted. Uh, donors who don't expect to get that money back in order to make specifically low budget but uh, artistically ambitious feature length narrative films because that is the thing that is absolutely lacking in Catholic film culture at this moment and it kind of always has uh, in, an in, in an independent forum and the reason I say that is because the only way anything in this medium, you know, especially the business side of it changes is if somebody takes the risk, they stick their neck out and they do the thing and then everybody goes, wow, that worked, we'll do it too. It's the only way this thing tends to happen. And I think especially in the US, the benefit from what I can see of the American context is you have a lot of money <laughs> in private domain that, you know, is uh, there's a possibility of that happening um, I think the state supporting that is obviously it would be hugely beneficial, but I can tell you from where I'm standing in Canada, uh, you know, we have some decent state support, but it's still, it's, it's a very competitive and there's plenty of obstacles there that, you know, get in the way as well. So I think it really takes somebody, it's, it will take uh, investors with vision who are willing to go straight ahead into the unknown and to trust talent that isn't totally proven. Um, one last thing I'll just mention, you mentioned short films. Short films are great for students and I love, I've, I've made short films, I've only, I should mention, I've only made short films, you know, uh, and they're wonderful, but they are not enough to convince uh, a wider audience of the validity or the viability of a film culture. Um, so I think features have to be the focus, but it has to be in a modest, uh, realistic way. Uh, one last question, very, very short, so we have time for response. If a new Vatican film list could include things like Najibi's films, you know, the children of heaven or the those beautiful films, what do you think? You guys know I'm not familiar with that. Well, well, yeah, I, I will just say, like, answering generally, this is a, a conversation that comes up a lot. I mean, for, for my part, I mean, I, I really am sticking up for Europe big time. However, I do think, like, I mean, even the original Vatican film list is, is obviously just sorely lacking in, like, so, like Asian films that could be, you know, Kurosawa, um, you're, you're a Taiwanese cinem cinema guy, right? Um, so, I mean, like, the, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Miyazaki, for example, I mean, Studio Ghibli movies, like, I mean, there, there's all kinds of stuff like that that I think would have to be, would have to be taken into consideration, which, by the way, is why there will never be a part two of the Vatican film list. There will not be. Uh, yeah. for, I mean, it would, be, it would be way too controversial, yeah. It, and, and that's fine. I, I want to say, like, the Vatican list, film list, in a sense, isn't that important. It's just kind of an excuse to get Catholics to watch some good movies, you know? It's it's yeah. it's it's interesting as a, a moment in church is quasi official engagement with this art form, but like I would love to see it become like a historical footnote because like people are just into this stuff and everybody's making their own list. You know what I mean? It it, it doesn't need to stay important. It's we're having a moment in a time when we're we're all looking for anything that can direct us and help to motivate a Catholic cinematic revival, and so that's part of it. Can we take a question from uh, Mr. Zanussi here? Uh, I'm afraid not. The problem ah. with being a moderator for these things is that you work for somebody else, 
and uh, you are required to be an executioner. Um, and Thomas Aquinas says of the executioner, the death of those executed is not the responsibility of the executioner, but of, them, <laughs> of those who command them. And I noticed uh, my friend Ken Hellenius, who works for the center, came in okay. near the end, and he's the representative of the of the. Uh, I'm the executioner. He's the representative who represents uh, okay. those who require that I cut us off, so that people can get to the next uh, um, session. So, please help me in thanking um, our speakers.